Hello and welcome to the Kevin Mannix Report. I'm Kevin Mannix, the host for our program, which is designed to give all of us a little more insight into what goes on inside our government and insight into the people who are involved in government throughout the state. Our guest today is a gentleman who has been deeply committed to service to our government and to the community and who is presently the Speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives, Lynn Lundquist. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Kevin. Great to be here. One of the things we try to do on this show is give folks a little bit more personal background information about people who are involved in government because we read about them in the paper and we see sound bites on television, but you don't really learn much about the person. Can you give us a little bit of a background, a sketch on yourself? Where were you born? Where are you from? Well, I was actually born in Condon, which is in my district. Didn't live there very long and then went to the valley. Grew up in the valley and lived there until 1976. And at that time, moved to Central Oregon. So I believe I have a unique perspective that I've, I've lived and worked and made my uh, income on both sides of the Cascades. Now, where did you go to school? I went to school, high school in Newburgh, but went to Oregon State University and then to University of Connecticut for my master's. Um, my expertise was in the field of economics. Did you begin teaching economics or working in business after that? Uh, I taught part-time at George Fox and Warner Pacific College, uh, just on a part-time basis for, I don't know, six or seven years, along with my ra uh, farming and ranching endeavors. So I've, I've been in agriculture all my life and in the production end. You mentioned farming and ranching. What kind of uh, farming and ranching operation do you have? Right now we have uh, primarily mint and cattle. Uh, I've always been a diversified uh, producer. Wheat, alfalfa, potato, those kind of things. Uh, so I, I believe in diversification, uh, whether it's uh, at the ranch or in the legislature or wherever it is. Well now, you got married at some point. You want to tell us a little about your family life? Well, yes. Uh, my wife and I have seven children. and. They are all, of course, growing and away from home now. We are raising a grandchild, a grandson. He's just ready to graduate from high school. And so the little different aspect from our family is that we've taken in nearly a dozen troubled teenagers, uh, not through any state program or anything, just by word of mouth. You know, one of our stu uh, kids would say, so-and-so's having trouble, or they'd be visiting our place. And before long, it seemed like uh, they were staying there. So great experience. So your ranch became something of a, a home for kids who needed a place to be and a place to for some comfort primarily support. needing some some discipline and some some love. Have you are you do you still have some kids that stay with you that way or or is that pretty much something in the past? Now? That's pretty much in the past. Uh, right now we have a young lady that lives just down the road a little ways, uh, who's. Uh, her mother is separated and she's on drugs and we would like to have her there but we don't have space with our grandson there and we have one of the bedrooms in the office so unfortunately uh, we don't have anybody there right now. Well you also run around the state a lot now in, in your position as speaker and of course just heavily involved as, as a representative also. I would think that too would make it harder to provide something of a home life. It's more difficult and uh, my wife works for me as my constituent person during the interim and actually works in the office during the session. So it does, it's hard to have that, that good solid home life that those type of children that we were working with need desperately. Now you're going into your third term in the House of Representatives. You've just been easily reelected in the general election and there was a primary battle where you had to overcome an opponent in, in, a, in a tough contest, although you ended up doing very well and having a wide margin of support in the primary. But before you went to the Oregon House of Representatives, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the community, some of the things that you did? Well, involvement in the community, I've, I believe, goes you know way back to when I lived in Newburgh, uh, just come home from college and uh, immediately got involved in the youth through the 4-H and FFA programs. Uh, the Future Farmers of America organization uh, has had a major impact on my life. My advisor in high school, I always say, has probably had more influence on my life than any other single person except for my parents. It's a great program and so that was sort of the, I guess, the initial stages. And then the customary school board and budget boards and all those kind of, of uh, I guess, groups that, uh, that we see as a what I consider a, a way to provide service to the community. And then I went into the Board of Agriculture, uh, was uh, president of the Oregon Cattlemen Association for a while, and really that is, those organizations along with the Planning Commission is what brought me to Salem as a, as a lay lobbyist, Kevin. Uh, not as a registered lobbyist, but I did a lot of lobbying for those different groups. 
And over the years, about how many years do you did you were you coming to Salem before you joined up in the House of Representatives? Not many, probably not many. I've always had, I guess, uh, politics and government as part of my blood a little bit. Always enjoyed observing it and and uh, re uh, reading about it. But it was probably within the last five, six years before I actually came to Salem in 1995 that uh, drove me t to that agenda. And frankly, what did it? Uh, Kevin was, as I participated in the process of providing testimony, and I believe it's a, it's a great process we have. It allows the general public to come in and have a testimony at the hearings process. But it's also it made it very plain to me, you know, if I want to really make a difference, I probably ought to be one of the people sitting up there listening to the testimony rather than giving the testimony. And that's really what uh, was the driving force why I got involved in politics. Now, you've just been elected to your third term. But uh, hearkening back to that first election contest, what was it like when you first hit the campaign trail for the House of Representatives? Well, it's a great experience for anybody, I believe. Uh, I happen to live in a district that is very vast. Uh, it's about 200, nearly 300 miles uh, east and west, and about 140 miles north and south. And I happen to live in the southwest corner of my district, so I have the opportunity to do lots of traveling. But when you first do that, there, to me, there's a a little bit of what are the people going to say, what are the questions they're going to you know, ask you, and do they expect you to have all the answers? Before long, you obviously find out they just want to know who you are, and, and what are your philosophies, and what do you stand for? And I don't think you need to have a great knowledge base as you run the first time. I think there's an increase in that after you've been in the session for a while. Are they looking for sincerity, integrity, common sense, those kinds of features? Ab absolutely. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of candidates as we recruit candidates and then try to get them through the political process successfully. And I was talking to one of them just the other day, yesterday as a matter of fact, and I said, do you remember when I told you uh, that what your constituents want to know is they want to know who, I was talking to Betsy Close, who, who is Betsy Close? What makes her tick? What is, uh, uh, you know, does she have those good, as you're saying, those good common sense beliefs that allow her to make decisions that are good for her constituents, sometimes not based on the total knowledge, because you and I both know it's difficult to have the knowledge base in all areas that we vote on. But you have that instinct, that common sense basis to make those right decisions. Very critical, Kevin. That's sort of the, the, the computer system, in effect, is, is your capability to to have common sense and to make decisions. And then the input can come from all the technical experts and the lawyers and the advocates, et cetera, et cetera. And then Absolutely. you can process that and make Absolutely. some decisions. Well, how did it go when you were campaigning? Do you go campaigning? You can't do door to door in that large well, district. Well, we actually do do our door to door in, in that large district because I have a, no, a number of cities. Uh, I go basically from Prineville clear to Baker City uh, on the Snake River or close to Snake River. So I do door to door in the cities, but I can't have the total percentage of doors that I knock on as you can obviously in your district. Um, but nevertheless, as you go in there to each city and you hold a town hall or a fireside chat or that sort of thing, and there may not be a lot that come, but the word gets out as you know. So it's very important that you do that. Uh, They're aware of your presence and the fact that you came to that town, even though they may not attend the meeting. Absolutely. And we did sort of a, what I consider a unique uh, situation in our primary this time. We had what we called fireside chats. And we actually sent a, a formal uh, invitation out to the people in a town or a part of a town and said, come meet the speaker and, and uh, let's talk about the issues. And we had a great cross-section of people come out, some that have never, that weren't out before. Um, I don't know what triggered that, but as you know, a lot of times when you go to a town hall, it's sort of the same, same people tend to come, but it was a unique idea that worked. Well, did you find that you learned some things from folks at those kinds of meetings, too? It's not just a one-way communication system, but a two-way communication system. You absolutely learn as you talk to the people. Uh, campaigns, I'm not sure that many people really relish them. But uh, they serve a very useful purpose. And as you said, I went through a very difficult primary campaign. But in that process, I had an opportunity to talk to lots of people. And, and you start to learn what makes them tick as well. Uh, you know, wh what do they really care about? Is it education, or is it their pocketbook, or what combination? And, and sometimes very specific things. But that's, that helps us in, uh, I think, making good policy as we work through the legislative process. Uh, Kevin, if we had an opportunity to meet 
every person in the district or nearly so. I don't think we'd have to have the expensive campaigns we have. Uh, and I think we spend way too much money. But the fact is, you don't have an opportunity to meet them. Yeah, in fact, it's the hard part is sending out so many messages, hoping that a few filter through. That's right, particularly in the latter days. Very much so. Well, now shifting to, from that, your first experience at campaigning and your mo most recent experience, uh, you went into the 95 session as a new legislator. How did you find the Legislative Assembly? Was it what you expected or different or what? Some, some the same, some what I expected and some the uh, things that were surprises. Uh, I did not realize the pace of the legislative session, the intensity uh, that is there literally from fairly early in the morning till, uh, you know, till uh, 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock at night, day after day. Um, I did not anticipate that there would be that uh, intensity of time being so restricted. Uh, you know what it's like. You're, you've been there for longer than I have. And literally, when you have to talk to someone as you walk down the hall because you don't have time to talk to them in your room, and that doesn't mean we don't want to talk to them. We just don't literally have the time. So, so that was a surprise to me. Going in, I, I knew that there would be a broad uh, base of issues with which to wrestle with, I guess. Um, but didn't really, uh, I guess, f realize the intensity of that or the, the breadth of those issues until you really get there. And Were you surprised about the uh, division that seems to occur in the Legislative Assembly between Democrats and Republicans? Uh, or is that something that you kind of anticipated? <laughs> I believe I anticipated that. Uh, Maybe it was a little bit more strident than I had anticipated. Um, as you know, I'm a consensus builder and have been all my life. And so those kind of situations simply become a challenge to me. How we bridge those, uh, those philosophies, how we bring good policy out of divergent opinions. That to me is really what's exciting about the legislative process. Do you think the caucus system itself, uh, well, I would think that your perception would be that the caucus system tends to exacerbate these differences because the Republicans will run off into their caucus room and the Democrats run off into their caucus room. And the one place they're meeting together is in committees and on the floor, but uh, is there some way to break down some of those barriers between the caucuses? I don't know that I have the answer to that, Kevin. We need to work towards that endeavor. I believe that. that uh, you know, as I, as I travel around the state, let me put it this way, uh, I, never, I travel many, many miles and I've hit a lot of potholes. I've never been able to identify whether it was a Republican or Democrat pothole. And I just use that as an example of how I think we have to pull that together. I think it's basically as we try to set the tone, I think that's part of leadership's responsibility, Kevin, as we go into the next session for the leadership on both sides of the aisle to try to set the tone that, yes, we'll have our differences and, and we will drive agendas that are specifically Republican since we're in the majority, but that will not be the, the mainstream. Uh, as you know, few, few uh, majors really have a straight R-D split. Uh, and I think that's good. I think it's good that we can come together and have a unified uh, approach on most issues. In fact, it seems that the media focuses on the issues that are divisive because that makes news and it's exciting, but 90% uh, plus of legislation that goes through goes through by overwhelming votes and support on both sides and then goes to the governor and gets signed into law. And, there's hardly a hoot or holler about it. That's right, and but those don't sell many papers. So we hear about all the, the floor fights and the division in the media, um, be it television or radio or the newspaper or whatever. Well, in this whole process, uh, as you evolved and you moved into the 97 session, uh, you became the speaker. How did that process work for you in terms of becoming speaker and working with the, uh, the various factions? Well, it's a... First of all, let me say it's a great challenge to be a speaker because you have many, responsi many heavy responsibilities and you literally, I believe, can help set the tone for the sessions. As I start into that speaker's role, first of all, as you're, I'm sure, aware, it's unusual to have a second-term person be speaker. And uh, I was majority leader during the interim in my first session, and that's what allowed me to develop those relationships with... Uh, with all of the candidates and with the, and with the uh, legislators that were still in, in the office. So that was the basis, I think, that allowed me to become speaker, was that I built those relationships. And that's very important in the process. Uh, and then the challenges. You know, the biggest challenge you have as a speaker to start with is putting the committees together. I think few people realize 
uh, how difficult that is and also uh, how much that sets the tone and uh, for whether we're going to have a productive session or not. In fact, um, we're going to pause for a moment, but we'll talk about uh, committees as soon as uh, we take this minor break. The break is designed to let you folks know that you're with us on the Kevin Mannix Report. Our guest today is the Honorable Lynn Lundquist, Speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives. And this program is designed to give you a variety of information about government and the people involved in government. If you ever have any questions, feel free to write to me at the Kevin Mannix Report, 2003 State Street, Salem, Oregon, 97301. You can also call in the Salem area. It's a local call. Otherwise, it's a toll call at area code 503-391-8031. And if you get a recording, please leave a message. We're not always on that phone, but we will get back to you to answer your inquiry, and we welcome your comments, questions, and concerns. Turning back to our guest today, Lynn Lundquist, uh, we were talking or starting to talk about committees in the House, and uh, a lot of folks may not realize that unlike other states, you don't amend bills on the House of the That's floor, true. Uh, the floor of the we're House. We're one of the few states. The so that the committees are where all the action is. Do you want to talk a little about the committee activity and how that relates to uh, how the assembly works? Well, first of all, let's talk about, I think, as we put the committee structure together. The committee chairmen are very, very important because they literally have the ability to hear a bill or not hear a bill if that's their, if that's their choice. Uh, a good committee chair is, is responsive to his, to his or her committee. Uh, but there is a lot of power. I think we need to recognize that, and people in Oregon should realize that there is a lot of power in the committee's in the committee chairman's uh, position. Uh, as we go through the hearing process, because a, a typical bill comes to, comes to the committee and then they have a hearing on that. And Kevin, to me, that is the heart and soul of our legislative process, is the fact that here's an opportunity for the participants, pro or con, to come together and to talk about the issue and then come to what I believe is the best uh, outcome. If you have all proponents, I don't think you come to the best solution. But when you have proponents and opponents come together and you hammer out the differences and you use your the diversion of opinions for strength rather than for division, that's how we get good policy. And I believe that the committee structure is really where it all happens. We go to the floor, we'll have, the, we'll have our uh, communications there uh, through, the, uh, through the process. Uh, and as you know, sometimes Typically, that doesn't change a lot of votes because of the work was in the committee structure itself. And you might have a comment from yours if you, uh, about that, but I believe that is really what, what holds this state together and where, that's where the good policy is developed. Well, in fact, you mentioned the importance of selecting good committee members and having a balanced committee to come up with a balanced product. That's the way to get a bill through the floor. If you have a committee that has its own agenda that's not in sync with what the House and the Senate want to do, they're going to send some, some, some bills down to the floor. They're going to crash and burn, as we might say. That's true. And, uh, and occasionally those things happen, but usually it's because somebody wasn't paying attention to what we, the feedback that was available. In that process, uh, we touched on the idea that you can't amend bills on the House floor. Most legislatures, including Congress, uh, we hear about floor fights where someone right. comes in and wants to move the bill in another direction by amending it. Now in Oregon, if, if there's a problem with the bill, it can be sent back to committee, but the rules don't allow amendments on the floor, so it's up or down, yes or no, and the debate focuses on that in that direction. In terms of the, uh, the committee process and how these bills come out, what kind of role does the speaker play in interacting with the committee chairs and discussing their agenda? Well, first of all, one of the areas that the speaker has some responsibility is when the bills come from legislative council after they've been drafted, then they come to the speaker's desk, and the speaker then uh, puts them in the, in the appropriate committee. And that in itself is a critical issue on some bills because we, have, we try to put the bills in the, in the committee that has the expertise for that, and that's how we try to make that, de that decision. But sometimes uh, there's uh, some politics get involved in that, obviously, and uh, a particular bill might have a better opportunity in one committee than another committee. So that's the first place that the speaker plays a role. Secondly, um, the speaker is in constant communication with the committee chair to make sure that some bill doesn't come out that the caucus really doesn't 
want to come out, or that some bill doesn't get uh, bogged down in the committee and not have the hearings uh, that it should have and get out on a timely basis so we for, then can send it to the Senate for their uh, uh, activity on that. So the speaker uh, sort of is the, the manager in the background that makes sure that that committee process is working and that the bills, particularly that we have as caucus agenda items, will move in appropriate manner. I would think that part of the challenge is making sure that things move in an appropriate manner. My favorite war story has to do with a bill that limited the liability of landowners who gave permission to outsiders to come on to the property either to go ham camp camping, picnicking, mm -hmm. hiking recreational purposes. And uh, when we worked up the bill, we made sure the relating clause, which also gives you some guide as to where a bill's going to go, it says relating to at the top of the bill, right. said relating to land. <laughs> if we put relating to liability, it would have gone to the Judiciary Committee. Right. But since it said relating to land, it went to the Natural Resources Committee in the House and the Senate. Um, and frankly, the strategy there was to be blunt about it, lawyers like to have people be liable and they would have held up this kind of a mm -hmm, bill mm -hmm. you know, or amended it to death with all kinds of whereases and wherefores so a landowner wouldn't know that they had a clear release from liability. So we went to natural resources where you tend to have ranchers and farmers and common sense people. Sure. It, it went right through on both sides, much to the consternation of some lawyers uh, who liked it to sue people, but uh, but we got a bill through that the governor signed that now says when a landowner gives someone permission to come on the land for recreational purposes and doesn't charge, mm -hmm. the landowner has no liability, which I think it increases the willingness of folks to be good neighbors and let people just you know cut across their property or go a hunt or fish or whatever. Anyway, there's an example of what the relating clause and the committee assignment can do to you. Have you had some some experiences where you've had to work to pull a bill out of committee to get a chair to overcome some resistance and you may not want to talk about specific individuals or anything but uh, how has that worked for you well, as speaker? We have had actually a few few bills I don't want to overemphasize it but there are a few bills that you need to go to the committee chair and say now this bill needs to move uh, or like on the, con on the other side of that is that you know this bill probably should not see the light of day um, because you have to look at your committee chairs, what their philosophy is, and how that works into the total caucus agenda. There is a role there for the speaker, and it's a very critical role, but I'd certainly want the uh, people watching this program to understand that there is not abuse of power in that process. Uh, by and large, uh, Oregon politics, I think, are very open, uh, which I say is admirable. Uh, they're, I think they're very clean, uh, and I'm proud of that. And that's something that as speaker I want to maintain. That's part of my agenda and personal agenda to make sure that we keep Oregon the political scene as, uh, as it is at the present. In uh, fact, under the, our own version of the open meetings law as it applies to the Legislative Assembly, you can never have a majority of the committee meeting anywhere to deliberate about a bill uh, unless there's been public notice ahead of time and it's a public meeting so that people have a chance to come and watch it happen. And, that's absolutely true, and another area right along with that is as we go through the hearings process, uh, I tell all of my committee chairs, lean over backwards for the benefit of the, the constituents that come in and, and want to testify. And we have the lobby there in the building all the time, uh, you know, and so they will be there. But when you have people come in, whether it's from Baker City, uh, 350 miles away or whether it's just in here in Salem. Uh, I want to make sure that they believe that they have had their, so to speak, day in court. Uh, and I think that's very critical to the process. And if, if we err, we're going to err on the side of uh, letting them have their say. You mentioned the lobby, and this is probably a good time to get into the interplay between the lobby and the legislators. The lobby is a very amorphous term. It includes people who work with government agencies who come over to provide information people who work full-time for mm -hmm. businesses who may represent that business at the legislature because it's a big business such as PGE or whatever and they interact with legislators and then you have uh, those who represent a variety of clients which may change from time to time and they they are there to watch out for their clients on bills and provide consulting mm -hmm. and that sort of thing and then finally they're all there to testify and yes twist legislators arms about amendments to bills and the like how do you feel about the interaction between lobbyists and legislators as it works in Oregon the lobbyists are absolutely an essential part of the political process or the legislative process. Without the lobbyists, uh, it would be very difficult to have a productive session. And the reason is because they bring so much information to, to the legislators. 
legislature and to an individual legislator. Uh, we have different, uh, I guess, abilities in the lobbyists. Uh, some perhaps are more uh, professional in their approach than others, but by and large, I, I absolutely believe that they provide a service and that without them, it would be difficult to make some good common sense decisions. Uh, if they get out of line and, and try to get too pushy, you and I know will identify those, and I think that doesn't go over very well. To me, the good lobbyist is the one that comes in, tells me what the reason I should vote for their bill, and at the same time tells me why I shouldn't vote for the bill. What is the opposition going to say? So we have, you know, not just the positive, we have the negative on the bill as well. That to me is what a good lobbyist is, and uh, you know, uh, you can identify those in your mind, uh, the ones that do that uh, very proficiently. Now, as part of the process, we do have folks who, um, uh, who may not understand that lobbyists do not have access to the House floor or the Senate floor mm -hmm. when we're in session and we're deliberating on bills. They truly do have to be out in the lobby. That's and true. They can't come through those doors. They can go up to the visitors' galleries above and watch like any citizen can, but they're not permitted down. They're not even allowed on the side aisle in the, uh, on the floor where special guests come in to watch, but lobbyists who are regularly there are not allowed in there, nor are they allowed in committee to go up into the area where the legislative members are sitting. They can send messages up and ask if someone can step outside. So we do have these areas, of the uh, sanctuaries for legislators where yeah. lobbyists uh, have access only if the legislator cares to step off the House floor or step out of committee. And of course, finally, legislators do have their offices, which are sanctuaries from anybody. Sure. Um, it seems that there's a balance in that process and that the lobbyists are not there twisting arms literally as, as the votes occur. How do you handle public perception about the lobby? Is it basically by explaining the process as you've just done or do you have any other ways of handling it? it no, it's like I, wherever I go and, we, and we'll have comments or questions about that and we'll talk about the lobby because I believe that the, the perception out there is that lobbies, that's bad. They're bad for the process and so I try to give the honest perspective of, of the role that they play. And uh, I simply say they should, they should be there for informational. They should not be there for undue influence. They're there to promote the cause of whatever special interest group that is, whether it's education or the elderly or whatever it might be. And I think that's a useful purpose. That's information you and I can use. So my role is simply, as I go around the state, and, and I do a lot of that, I often talk about the lobby and the fact that uh, we need them, um, but they need to also uh, be restrained to where they don't have undue influence. There are significant restrictions too, and the folks may not be aware that during session, uh, legislators may not receive campaign contributions. That's, that's true. And um, there are strict limits on what you can receive in terms of gifts. I think it's a hundred dollar limit in a year from any one person uh, uh, other than an immediate relative. So that uh, these ideas of lobbyists showering legislators with gifts just don't pan out, do they? No, no they don't. And um, we obviously have questions about different times about, you know, well, are you influenced because someone gives you $1,000? The, the banking association gives $1,000. To the campaign. To the campaign. And not individually, obviously, but to the campaign. I'm glad for that clarification. Uh, and, I, and I answer it this way, Kevin. If, if I'm going to be influenced by $1,000 in my campaign, I should probably not be in that process. And that's just, I feel very, very strongly about that. And on that positive note, I'm going to have to say we have to stop because our time has run out. And, uh, and I very much appreciate your joining us on the show today. I thank our audience for joining us with the Honorable Lynn Lundquist, Speaker of the House. We'll see you again next time. Take care.